So to improve audio quality, please remain muted unless you intend to speak. And thank you for being on time. Please note that this gathering is being recorded and live streamed and the video will be made available to watch later. I'm Dave Hunt, an engineering manager for the Firefox performance testing team. And I started these gatherings as a way to keep up with those projects and practices. The current format is a monthly gathering with a guest to talk about a project they're working on or a passion of theirs. Sorry, uh, one second. I just had to mute something. Um, so yes, the format is a monthly gathering with a guest to talk about a project they're working on or a passion of theirs. Uh, please join the Automation News channel on IRC or Slack, as these may be used for sharing resources and can also be used for discussion and questions. I try to schedule these meetings every month, but the times and dates vary depending on guest, guest availability. The schedule is currently clear, uh, although I do have a few suggestions to follow up on. If you're interested in being a guest, please let me know. Or if there is a guest you'd like me to reach out to or a topic you're interested in, please do get in touch. So if you've just joined, I'd like to remind you to please remain muted unless you intend to speak. And note once more that this event is being recorded and live streamed. Our guest today is Gilles Dubuc. Uh, Gilles has focused on web performance at the Wikimedia Foundation for the past five years as part of its dedicated performance team. Recently, his focus has been on real user metrics and performance perception. He can be found on Twitter as Full Stack Jerk. I would encourage you to interrupt if you have any questions rather than save them for the end. With that, over to you, Gilles. Hi, well, thanks for having me. Um, so, yes, again, feel free to interrupt me if you have questions throughout uh, what I'm going to be talking about. Um, so, I'm going to describe some of the work that we've done for the past year uh, at the Wikimedia Foundation, specifically on Wikipedia. Um, I call this real user opinion metrics. It's a new uh, way of approaching uh, performance uh, measurements. Uh, and so I'm going to delve into uh, what we've done and what we learned from doing this. Um, so uh, one big problem that we've struggled with as the Wikimedia performance team is that we collect a lot of raw metrics directly from users. Uh, but we don't know which ones truly matter to users. Um, you know, there's a, like this is just a few of the many we collect between things that happen very early in the page load, like first paint, or quite late, like load even ends. Uh, we don't know what captures best um, what real users uh, care about when it comes to a page performance. So it's, it's been like a never ending debate within the team, which one should be the one that we focus on. Um, you know, we can't watch everything. And if we're gonna report on uh, metrics, both synthetic and run um, to the organization, we can't just report on 15 different metrics. We have to pick what's the most important. Uh, which is why uh, here we reached out to uh, researchers at the Telecom Paris Tech University. <laughs> the reason why I contacted these researchers specifically is that I had done a, a very extensive literature review of all the academic research that had been done on performance perception. And, um, and these people kept showing up, especially Dario Rossi, in papers that were quite relevant to us, what I was trying to figure out. So when I reached out, they were very interested in helping out. Um, and essentially, our goal has been to study the perception that users truly have for the performance on Wikipedia. So the, in practical terms, uh, the way this was done and still is being done um, is that over a period last year, we collected in the form of a micro survey uh, inside the pages on a small sample of visitors asking them um, what they think, uh, what they thought of the performance. So this is, we presented the research um, this spring at the web conference. So you can see on the poster, there's a little um, screenshot of this. So this is the micro survey that was running on several Wikipedias in different languages. Five wikis also, wikis are not Wikipedias, but Wikipedia is where we got the most interesting data because it had more traffic. And so we got a lot more user responses there. So we asked people if they think that the page that just loaded was fast enough 
uh, and they can reply with yes, no, or not sure. Um, so this is something that hasn't been quite done in a scientific manner on websites before. It's been done for applications like Skype um, or you know other audio conferencing where you know at the end of the call they ask if the call was good quality, etc. Uh, so there's a number of applications that have done this, but not actual websites, to our knowledge, at least not in ways that have been published. Um, and so th this is the data set that we were working with. So collecting data between uh, May and October last year. And um, you know, what this, the important part of these figures is that we had a fairly high satisfaction ratio. So 84.8% .8 of the people uh, who responded um, thought Looks like we may have lost you there, Shid. And you're muted now. Let me unmute you. There you go. Mm. Am I unmuted now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, it dropped out of Zoom. I'm not sure what happened. Uh, can you see the slides again? Or do you need to reshare? I guess you need to share again, right? You want me to reshare, yeah. Yeah, okay. So I was saying that um, the, the results as they stood were quite encouraging. The vast majority of people are happy with the performance. We have 7.7% of the people who don't know. Uh, you know, we, got, we gave that option to opt out in case people didn't understand the question or didn't pay attention to the page being loaded. You know, if they opened it in a separate tab, maybe they didn't pay attention to whether it was fast or not, things like that and about 7.5% of the respondents uh, were not happy with the performance. Um, so one thing that comes up, uh, in, when I brought up this idea, even before it happened, the usual reaction is, well, you're gonna have a selection bias. It's like Yelp, only the people who are unha unhappy are gonna leave a review. Well, we actually looked at that, and this is not the case. So the graph on the right shows the distribution of uh, actual performance for people who did uh, decide to reply and people who uh, decided not to reply to the survey. Like we know that they saw the survey and decided not to click on anything. And so we see that those lines are extremely close to each other, uh, especially contrasted to the graph on the left, uh, which is how it differs between people who did reply and said uh, yes or happy, no they're unhappy or they're neutral. So this left graph is also interesting because, um, you know, as the performance of the page degrades and becomes slow. Uh, these diverge very quickly. Um, you know, there's a little difference between happiness and, uh, and and happiness, but there is a great deal of overlap for fast pages. Essentially, uh, when looking at fast performance scores for the page load, some people are happy with those figures and some people are unhappy with those figures. So there's not like a universal threshold beyond which everybody gets becomes happy. Like the of course, the ratio of positive to negative responses in, improves, but you never end up with zero negative responses, even when you have a fast page load. Um, and so this indicates that there's not really any like golden number you can tell people below which uh, users will be all users will be happy with performance of the page, um, which you know goes against a lot of things you hear, like real guidelines telling you that you should load things under X amount of milliseconds and everybody will be happy. Um, so other findings, main findings of this study, uh, there was no temporal correlation. So something we expected at first was that possibly when people are at home or at the office, they react differently, and uh, you know, and we could map that to uh, local times, for example. Uh, but even looking at a specific country at different times of the day, there was no difference. People, people's opinion didn't change if they accessed the website at night or during the day. Uh, so we were lucky enough, so we were studying uh, Russian Wikipedia in particular, and it was during the period of the World Cup where they lost at some point at home. So we figured that this should be the kind of global news event um, that might affect people's mood. And so if people's mood was affected, maybe they would reply differently. And then seemed to be the case during those days, the ratios didn't change. They were the same as before and after. Um, so again, this kind of goes against some studies, uh, like for example, uh, Akamai have been uh, quite keen to record what they call rage clicks, 
you know, people um, clicking furiously at the screen because something doesn't load as a proxy for user frustration. In this case, when asked for their opinion, uh, even though there was something that was really upsetting to a large number of people who were browsing the website at that point, it didn't, uh, I would say, transfer the general mood to their appreciation of the page performance. Um, so that's encouraging in the sense that that means that our measures are quite robust and people are not responding about uh, something else and using the response to the service for uh, venting their frustration. Um, so one piece of surprising bad news is that uh, when you look at uh, all the RAM metrics we collect, so we collect a lot of, uh, like maybe, I don't know, 20 or 25 of them, uh, they all have very weak correlation to the response when looked at individually. So the, the best one, uh, I believe, in the study that came out was load even end, and it had only 0 0.04 correlation to people's responses, and that was the best. So you could say that the best from metric right now in terms of mapping to user satisfaction is really the least terrible one. Browser and device matter in different ways. That's not a big surprise. And something that was um, unexpected and that we might study further in follow-up studies is that our registered users were happier on average, despite having worse performance. So I have to explain this. Um, in our current architecture, if you are logged in, if you are a contributor that logs into Wikipedia, writes articles, uh, you are going to our uh, main data center in the US, which means that if you're in Russia, for example, uh, you're having a slower performance objectively uh, if you're logged in, but if you're logged out and you're hitting a local cache, which in this case will likely be in Amsterdam. And so uh, essentially logging in right now on Wikipedia is a performance uh, penalty. And surprisingly, registered users across the board were happier about the performance than their logged out counterparts. So some of this might have to do with the fact that since they come on the website a lot, they're kind of used to its usual performance. And also there might be some brand affinity. If they are registered and they contribute, they like Wikipedia and that might affect their opinion uh, of our performance. So something we tried after this was to take the data and since we saw that there was very really poor correlation for individual metrics, we thought, well, why not try to combine all of them into machine learning model and see if we can come, come up with a model that will map to uh, user opinion better than individual metrics. So we just basically uh, put everything we collect in this model um, and, and try to see if we could make a, a good prediction model based on all the data we collect at the same time as we ask people their opinion. So basically all the navigation metric, uh, navigation timing metrics, resource timing, all that stuff. Um, and it's not great. Um, so the, as you can see on the right, the best uh, we were able to achieve was around 0 0.6 precision, precision and recall, um, you know, focusing on the negative recall. Like our goal was to basically hopefully create a model that could tell us this page has a problem, even though we don't necessarily need to ask the person. Like ultimately it would be nice to, kind of get the questionnaire out of the equation and just be able to figure out what a human would have thought of the page load. Um, and so flipping a coin would be 0 0.5, and at this stage, you're at 0 0.6. It's, it's a little bit better than, uh, than you know, picking at random, but it's not great. So all in all, um, it's an indication that the current Run metrics we can collect passively with browsers are still very far from um, from being close to user opinions. So, I you know ideas we have for future work based on this. Um, so, something we did uh, obviously was to shuffle the order. In the example I gave, you know, you had yet you had yes first. I'm not sure in the middle, no last. So we shuffled that in practice to avoid you know any kind of bias. It would be for people to pick the first option, uh, but we did not collect. Uh, the order that was presented. And so that's something that we want to study because we wonder if despite shuffling, maybe some combinations are a bit strange. Like if you have not sure, no, yes, for example, uh, and that might affect the way people respond. So we want to make sure that despite the shuffled order, uh, distribution stays the same regardless of which order you were dealt, basically. Um, we want to ask more questions to figure out um, whether this brand affinity um, theory holds, whether the fact that people like the brand and the project 
might affect their perception and their judgment. Uh, we didn't have any honeypot question, so that's uh, fairly typical of questionnaire-based uh, scientific studies. Essentially, um, sort of very basic question, almost like a captcha that checks that people are paying attention. And even better, if that honeypot question is about the topic that we're dealing with. So uh, ideally, we'd want a question that would check that people understand what uh, the performance or the speed of the page means, for example. And so we could read out people who just click randomly and don't understand what they're being asked. Um, uh, recording history of performance of previous page views. So this is looking at pages in isolation. But something that we would like to look into at some point is uh, how, how is the opinion affected by the performance they were experiencing just before? So maybe the current page view was slightly faster or slightly slower than the previous one, for example. And that's not being captured here. We're only looking at um, metrics for the current page view. And so people interacting with the website it's a whole experience. It's not just that page view in isolation. And so knowing that maybe it was a dip or, or the opposite, maybe it was a slightly faster page view than what they experienced in the previous minutes, for example, would be helpful and might give us some insight in the fact that maybe uh, people uh, are more sensitive to performance variations than they are about absolute performance, for example. And we started collecting a lot more data, and we hope that when we have enough, we can attempt to use deep learning and not uh, simple machine learning on the data to possibly come up with a better performing model than what we did. So um, when Mozilla contacted me to, to come speak, uh, you guys said that you were interested in mobile specifically. So I, the survey has been running ever since. We didn't stop when the study ended. In fact, we increased the amount of sampling that we do. So we, we always, we're still asking people what they think of the performance of Wikipedia. And so I looked at recent data uh, focusing on mobile web. So we, we collect so many responses that we're, we're collecting 40, 24,000 survey responses per day across different uh, languages on Wikipedia. So that's a lot. That's 24,000 people telling us their opinion about performance every day. And so uh, this is something that we ended up using for uh, new purposes and not just the original study. Um, There's something else we introduced since the study is uh, a worker-based uh, CPU micro benchmark. So something we started to um, wonder about is the, the effect of the environment uh, and what people are using to connect to us. So um, you know, user agents is very limited in the information you can get, even more so on iOS devices. And so we needed a way to figure out um, if the person's device was essentially fast or slow at the time they experienced the page load to try and figure out what the influence of the device might be on their uh, perception. And so we introduced this idea of using a worker. So that means it's going to function in a separate thread, hopefully on the multi-core um, device, which is a norm now. It might also mean running a different core, meaning it's not competing with uh, the usual browser tasks. Um, and so we use that with a you know, small loop that does nothing uh, except figure out the CPU capacity at this point in time to to kind of get to come up with a micro, micro benchmark score that we can use to, to guess how fast or slow the device is at that time. Um, and so this is some very recent data. So I, I looked at April to August um, and on Spanish mobile uh, Wikipedia mobile site and, and the Russian mobile site. Um, so I'm looking at a specific slice of performance. So looking at load even end, which if you remember from the study we did was the least terrible run metric. So we tend to focus on that now, uh, especially since it covers more of the experience. It's kind of, we're, we're not following the, I would say the, the, the trend uh, of uh, focusing on the very early stuff. Like nowadays, you know, Google and other organizations are focusing on new standards like first mini from paint, first contentful paint, all that stuff. Um, it's our opinion now, based on the study, that um, we're kind of we're probably over focusing on the very early stages of the page construction, and that the experience beyond that is more important. And so, load even end is um, interesting because it covers more of the load experience. 
some would argue a lot of stuff that people don't see because it's beyond the fault. But then again, the study showed that this was the best correlating figure we had, so which is why we, nowadays we tend to look at this one as our go-to metric for um, for RAM. So the idea here is to look at the evolution of user satisfaction ratio over web over time. And so I decided to look only at this very specific slice of load event and performance because I want to see basically are is people are people's opinion changing uh, for the same performance. So the page took the same amount of time to load, uh, roughly, I mean, the same bucket. Um, but then between April and August, we can see on the main graph that we have here that their satisfaction in increased by almost 3%. So that's a bit strange. Um, you would think, you know, some people might say, you know, about the survey, many people are going to get fatigue, even though we only show it to a very small portion of visitors. And you know, if fatigue was happening, you would expect that they would not get happier about performance over time. Um, and so one thing that I mapped this against is the benchmark scores that I talked about earlier. So when you when you graph the, the, the median CPU score for the same um, performance uh, page views, you can see that uh, the scores have declined uh, significantly. And the lower score means a faster device. So essentially, in this small time span between April and August this year, uh, devices have gotten significantly faster to the point that we're seeing the effect very clearly on the micro benchmark that's run across all visitors that are being sampled. And so um, people's satisfaction increasing might be uh, that their devices are getting better, but it doesn't translate into a faster page load. So that's a bit strange. People are getting, they're getting the page to load as fast as before but they're happier. The devices are faster too. So we looked at another um, API that we have access to, which is device memory. Device memory tells you the current available memory and gigabytes on the device. It's bucketed. And here we have the, I mapped the evolution between uh, April and August. So during the same period. So in red, you have the old, uh, the oldest data from April. And in uh, yellow, you have the latest in August. What you see here is that the um, the ratio of the of people with not a lot of memory around one gigabyte uh, available goes down. So we have less people with uh, critically low memory on their phone. And on the contrary, you can see there's a huge uh, increase of people who have around four gigabytes available memory. Basically, this whole graph is shifting right. It's shifting towards getting more memory. So they got faster CPU during that period and significantly more available memory. You can see the difference is quite big. It goes from 22% of uh, measured visitors that had four gigabytes uh, that rounded to the four gigabyte bucket to 27%. So the rate at which people are updating their devices is very significant. We believe that since um, you know we, we always roll out small performance improvements, but there was nothing in this period that was significant, it could explain that suddenly we go from 86 to 89% satisfaction. And so it's more likely that this drastic change in the environment is what uh, made people happier with the internet browser experience. So what could be happening? Um, so while the initial page load time is the same, uh, having a faster device means that you're using less memory to browse a website. And there have been studies uh, that have shown people have actually quite aware of how um, battery consumption heavy may be. And so um, users are actually quite savvy about this. So that if they feel they're using something that's uh, using battery, they might get frustrated and use it less. Um, the user agency is more responsive. So beyond the initial page rendering and load, once they start interacting with the page, it should feel smoother. Scrolling should be smoother as well. And overall, uh, it, it should give them better performance beyond the initial page load. So even if, for example, they are network bound, and so it's never going to load faster initially, once they start using the page and doing things with it, it should feel smoother, and maybe that's why they're happier. There are recent studies that point to CPU being the main bottleneck on mobile. And so uh, all of this shows that the device capabilities at a given time, because Again, what I, you know, the, the idea of the micro benchmark also is to capture the fact that if you take a given uh, phone and you look at how it performs when the battery is full 
or when the battery is low, you can have very different scores because the CPUs are going to get throttled, uh, et cetera. And so uh, the status, the, the capability of the device at the time people are accessing uh, the website is going to matter a lot. Another potential theory was, uh, when we looked at this, was whether other people got slower. So we know that Wikipedia's performance at the very least stayed stable during that period and probably improved looking at all the metrics that we have. Um, and so we thought, well, maybe it's the rest of the web getting slower. And so in comparison, people are getting more satisfied with Wikipedia because it's refreshing to go back to a website that's still fast when everything is getting slower. And so we looked at Google specifically because it should be no surprise that we get a lot of our traffic from Google. Um, you know, for example, on mobile, 52% of our page views come from a search engine, and the vast majority of which is Google. So basically, you can almost say that half of the people who come on a Wikipedia page at any given time came from a Google search. And so I went to um, Crux, to Google's own report of, um, of RUM metrics that you can look up for any website. And a look at Google search. And sure enough, between April and July, uh, their performance degraded. And so it's possible that since a lot of people come from the search engine, often Google, uh, if that experience uh, is getting slower in comparison, we're looking better. And that might be one of the factors why uh, people are getting more satisfied when they land on our pages and they answer our survey after the pitch loaded. So overall, I think um, this is a wake-up call for everyone in the performance community to think about not looking necessarily just at the metrics in isolation, the run metrics that you collect, but the real question is, are we, keeping, are we keeping up with the expectations people have of the websites, of our specific websites, and uh, how does it fit in the change of the technology technological environment, the devices and the network are improving. So one big problem that we're having right now that's unsolved is when we look at our own metric, our run metrics over the course of say a year, they improve. But how much of that is due to people getting faster devices and faster networks? And how much of that is due to us making improvements? To a degree, you could be seeing your run metrics improve over the course of a year, but in fact, you've missed out on some of the environmental improvements and you're technically getting slower comparatively to what would be possible given the, the, the improvements that happen uh, outside of what you control. And so it's very important to find ways like this CPU micro benchmark, which is just one step, that really other uh, things we could look into to try to figure out how we can take the improvements of the environment outside of the equation. How can we correct the run metrics that we collect to know uh, like how much of it was really thanks to us or in how much of it was thanks to the environment. So we used uh, those metrics for other things. Recently, we participated in, in a few origin trials for upcoming APIs. And so having this, um, this user opinion about performance has been very useful for us to kind of benchmark those new, uh, those new metrics to try and see uh, if people, for example, experienced a slow click response uh, with even timing, uh, if they experienced a bunch of those, did that affect their opinion, et cetera? So it's interesting to see that there are new APIs that now go beyond the initial page loaded page render. And layout to stability, for example, is once you've loaded the page and you interact with it, are there things that inserted themselves in the DOM and make the display unstable? Um, even timing, so you're clicking on or interacting with something and the event handler is being slow and element timing, looking at specific elements and when they're actually rendered on the screen and not just when they were added to the DOM, which is a very big difference from what we were capable of doing before. So now you can essentially get the equivalent of first band for a specific element. And so um, you know, I'm not going to go into our findings for these, but it was helpful to have that as a way to kind of verify basically the value that we get from these new APIs. Are they helping with increasing uh, the coverage that we get to get closer to the perception that people have. And that's it. Um, we're hiring, so if you're interested in that stuff, uh, contact us. And if um, I'm ready to take questions, if there are any.
Hey girls, that was um, really impressive. I appreciate you um, uh, coming and doing this talk and especially the, uh, the mobile stuff that you were talking about at the end. Um, mm -hmm. I, do, I do have a couple questions for you. Um, and I'm, I'm, I, I love your approach to uh, data analysis on this. And I like the context that you are coming up with where you're pointing at the, the technosphere that the users have, the, the devices and the networks, because that's something that we're finding in our own telemetry for mobile is that indeed the hardware is getting very, very uh, capable um, very quickly. And so we're kind of resetting mm -hmm. expectations about like uh, what's normative or what's, what's a low end device is kind of getting uh, changed with great deal frequency right now. Um, yeah. Do you, uh, and so it's cool to see that you're you're kind of c confirming some of that, some of that uh, some of that data that we're seeing as well. Um, when you're talking about element timings, um, the Wikipedia site is kind of an interesting case because it's um, it is not super image he heavy in general. So I'm just kind of curious if you can talk a little bit more about like what elements you're using as your key elements and like. How does that relate to some of these newer metrics like uh, largest contentful paint? And have you found that useful? So from, from memory, uh, we tracked the top article image and the first paragraph. And uh, the, the, the good problem that we have is that we tend to be so fast that those are part of the initial render anyway. And so we didn't find that there was a big enough difference that it was worth tracking on its own. Essentially, on Wikipedia, first paint and first contentful paint are the same, and then the new element timings tend to be almost the same. And a lot of the time, they're identical. Um, you know, if, if you look at, uh, you know, if you record um, Wikipedia on wet pitch tests, you usually experiences, you know, uh, blank, and then suddenly you have the top paragraph and often the the top image there or soon after. So it hasn't been a big enough differentiator that so far we felt that we really need to set that up as fast as possible. Because the initial, you know, the initial trial that we did didn't show us that it was going to be extremely promising or like the big issue I'm seeing is that again, this is it's it's good that those are happening finally because we can make metrics that are really custom to the website. Of course, if you know web technology was such that there was a big difference between the initial paint and the first paragraph it matter a great deal to us to be able to track that and know that that's when people can start reading the, the the article so for other websites that are not i guess not as optimized as we are right now it's extremely useful it's just that we've optimized performance for a long time and so it tends to be that those happen at the same time and so at the stage we're at in terms of studying our performance those slicing that part of the page load into thinner and thinner slices does not add a great deal of value for us uh, because we look at correlations, they're all pretty much the same because all these things happen in a very short time frame. And when you think of people interacting with the page, we're actually like, we're, it's like we're, we're dealing with an elephant and we're focusing on its toe with a microscope and, and it really doesn't stop there at all. People do a lot of things to the page afterwards. And uh, to say that we've kind of, Kind of fell into the trap of following the industry and focusing on these shiny new metrics for the initial stuff too much, and we haven't spent enough time measuring the rest of user interactions that happen beyond initial page load, etc. I'm really excited to see. I'm much more excited about things like layout stability and even timing because those capture aspects of the user experience related to performance that were not uh, possible to capture well before. Like that go. If you think of the timeline of somebody loading a page and then interacting with it. It makes you explore that other part that we've been kind of neglecting because it's, I guess, harder to standardize. You can't like give a performance score, uh, you know, over the whole interaction of the page because people are going to do very different things with very different websites. And also, to to so to a degree, um, I know that uh, browsers tend to expose things that are easy to expose. So that's why the first performance metrics we had was, were the ones that were cheap for the browser to expose and necessarily the ones that were capturing the user experience the best. And also, I know there's a lot of demand in the industry, especially people who don't do their own performance measurements, to have just uh, ready-made scores that just work. You know, they don't, they don't want to have to go and set up many different things on their page to figure out what the user is doing. And so that's the kind of stuff we're more interested in. It's, it's, expanding the toolkit so that we can uh, have custom measurements that are closer to the user experience. But I understand that for 
a lot of websites, it's just too much investments in performance measurement. And it's just much simpler for them to have first meaningful paint or something like this that's easy to understand, easy to share to non-technical people, et cetera. Um, I guess your mileage may vary on, in terms of how much you want to invest in your performance uh, tracking. Because at the end of the day, even if um, you know first paint is not great, it's better than nothing, and it still will correlate. Uh, currently, it correlates enough to the rest of the performance metrics that you can say that as a minimum, it's it's decent. Um, but I I have a feeling that even when we add these new ones that I'm talking about, uh, even timing and layout stability, will still be very far from anything that even combined a machine learning model can get close to to what people respond. I think there's still a big mystery there to to solve. And if you know if I had the means to, I would like to also uh, do some lab studies with people to try and investigate like what's going on. Why are people why are we getting people who get like 30 millisecond page loads and are not happy? Like I would like to be able to pull that person out of the computer and ask them like what what happened? Like why why are you still not happy with most of this page? Um, so yeah, there's still a lot of Unknowns, uh, but it, you know it's exciting to see so much progress and so much work in APIs. So I, I welcome all endeavors, even the ones that we don't end up using ourselves. I think it's great that people are still trying really hard to solve that problem. Yeah, you've I've, I like that you've kind of settled on the um, load event end, um, and that seems like if. I know that there's a browser time performance testing framework, uh, framework from Wikipedia, and that has a metric called fully loaded. Um, mm -hmm. And that, uh, that's also kind of the same thing. It's kind of like, when is this page done for the user kind of metric? Um, so I, I think that that's a really intriguing um, weight that you've assigned to that. I think that's really uh, that's, uh, telling uh -huh. it's something, something we're looking at. I think that again, we've been kind of influenced by this idea of looking at the page like a, like a static thing where the above the fold is this window that never moves. But when you look at people interacting with the page, they're not like, especially on their phones, they're not waiting for everything to be loaded before you start scrolling. And so um, I think uh, the fact that we saw that um, these old school uh, metrics like will even end that were unfashionable because people thought, well, this is too much of this stuff happening that people don't see. When in fact, I think people are actually feeling the effect uh, of often maybe trying to scroll and the stuff is just not there. Um, and so I think that uh, we, this assumption that people are just in front of their screen, sitting and waiting for the whole load to happen before they interact is not true. And so um, again, it would be interesting to like with layout and stability and things like that, like being able to measure the jank that happens, especially very early when people try to interact with the page, I think this would be critical. Like, like if you, you know, finding these metrics, kind of figure out how unresponsive and, and janky the page was when people try to interact with it, that might matter a lot more um, than, than what was above the fold initially. Plus, it's so difficult to, to define above the fold today. With so many different devices and 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 pixel densities, it, it's, it's kind of meaningless. Like the choice you make is always going to be arbitrary. It's going to be um, wrong for a lot of users. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to monopolize questions here, but I do have <laughs> I have one more, um, and that is like, how can we collaborate with you in terms of the data side? Because you're asking for a lot of stuff that we can't really. That you really that are not exposed for web APIs and frankly don't look like they will be exposed. Things like uh, memory pressure, yes. and pressure. Those are things that we actually have internally in uh, Firefox telemetry. Um, um, but like, is there a schema or is there some kind of um, way that we can work with Wikipedia to kind of um, ha to like improve our browser and your website with some way to get at uh, client public data like what are the barriers that you see there um so while uh being able to collect this ourselves would be nice i think it's what we really need is aggregate information if you could tell me um the the pace at which the processing power of devices is increasing over time uh, then we could kind of correct our uh, run metrics uh, based on that formula like for example 
um, the browser was doing some measurements of uh, its own processing capabilities and then reporting that uh, to users who opt in to share that data. Uh, and then you shared like uh, very high level, very aggregated figures about, let's say people who browse Wikipedia tend to have devices that fall in that bucket, uh, or you have X, uh, you know, X percent of users that are have critical, criti critically low memory that access that website, et cetera. And I know I, I didn't show this in, in these slides, but we, we know for a fact that the distribution of device types is very different depending on the language that we're dealing with for Wikipedia. If you look at Spanish Wikipedia or English Wikipedia, it has is completely different. The types of devices we get, how the capabilities, how fast they are, and so it would be like it would be very interesting for us to be able to um, to to get that kind of report for let's say each uh, subdomain, for example, and that would kind of let us adjust uh, our assumptions of are we doing better? Like to, to me, the, the big thing that's really frustrating is we don't know if we are doing better than last because the environment changed so much that yes, the metrics are better, but maybe they could have been even better, which just didn't change anything. In which right. case, that means we had a performance regression, but it was masked by the, the improvements of the technology. And so, yes, if it's difficult to expose that directly for privacy purposes, then if you were able to publish a report of a very aggregated version of this, then it would be extremely useful to us. That's great. Yeah, because we're seeing in like certain regions, especially Asia by country, we're looking at top 10 devices and we're seeing like in Asia, a lot of those top 10 devices, you know, well, there'll be three tablets in the top 10. Um, and yeah. that's not something we see elsewhere. Um, so <laughs> I, I agree, mm -hmm. like that kind of like aggregated machine information per region, specifically for Wikipedia pages, that would be the thing that would be useful to you. Um, but uh, specifically, their real capabilities, not just a theory of this was this model and, and that brand, because we see very big uh, variation. And for, for a given device type, the, the performance can be very, very different. I'm sure it's mostly coming from a low memory scenario, which right now we don't have any visibility about. Like some people show up and their their devices are very bloated. I'm guessing if it's like an Android device that has lots and lots of applications installed and stuff in the background, then has a big impact on how fast the browser really is once those people browse us. So it's not just knowing what types of device they're using. It's also it's it's actually that's almost irrelevant to us. Like we don't care what brand and make they have. What we care about is um, how fast that device is able to process DOM, for example. But the part that's actually, or process JavaScript, um, you know, the part that's actually going to be done by the device that doesn't depend on the network, that's the, uh, the, you know, the score that they're interested in is that. It's, and, and at that particular time when they were visiting Wikipedia, because, um, you know, maybe they use different websites in different contexts, like maybe when they're running out of battery to avoid some websites, because they know those are very heavy and they might drain the battery. And so it'd be good to know, like maybe we find out that uh, when people have low battery, they avoid us more than others, or on the contrary, they end up only looking at sites like Wikipedia because they know it's safe and it's not going to be using a lot of battery. Uh, so it, like all these things would be interesting, but mostly I want something that can allow us to, uh, to correct our global web performance metrics, to know are we lagging behind or are we staying on course with the technological improvements. And that has to be based on the on the real capabilities of the device uh, at the time they access the website. If it's too theoretical to disconnect it with like theoretical uh, capabilities, uh, offline capabilities if you want, then I'm not sure that's going to be um, good enough for us to arbitrarily correct our own metrics and say this is the real, um, the real performance once you adjust for uh, the devices. So do you think that the CPU micro benchmark is more useful at determining that kind of stuff? other than like the Android system calls for CPU temperature and uh, pressure? Uh, no, we did that because that was the first thing that came to mind okay. <laughs> that we could okay. do in, in our context. Um, but uh, it's possible that other things would be uh, more useful and better correlated to um, to the, the opinion people have, for example. So yeah, we're interested in looking at other things, like anything that we can uh, measure uh, in the browser would be helpful. That has to do with the current device capabilities, temperature, 
uh, yep. like you said, so apparently it was a really good uh, proxy for knowing what's going on. So yes, the, like if you have um, good data that shows you that one of these things is a, is a really good proxy for knowing the current state of the device and how its processing is efficient, then yeah, that's exactly what we'd be looking into. Like that's what we'd like to have. Like the CD micro benchmark was just basically given the tools that exist right now, it was the one thing we could do. And also, it's, right. it's been useful because workers have been supported for a long time, and so that allows us to run those things on a lot of different devices. Whereas the the unfortunate part of a lot of those new APIs is that it's, it's limited to only uh, uh, a small section of our user base, which is people using well, not a small section, but a partial section, which is people who have recent browsers, um, you know, and browsers that keep up with new APIs. Uh, which is unfortunately not the case of every browser out there. And so uh, workers were uh, convenient for that because they work pretty much everywhere that we support our JavaScript experience. And so we were able to measure things on devices where usually even some of the more advanced RAM metrics we cannot collect at all. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's, um, that's really fascinating. We're working on some things here and we're hoping to um, collaborate with you on um, getting you some of this data um, in the mm -hmm. medium to longer term. Yeah. Great. That's awesome. Yeah. Do, do you, um, do you um, use, do you think any of these, um, the content, you were talking a little bit earlier about being signed in and kind of differences in where users are, like that changing the network topology for users. So if you're signed in, you're going to be hitting a data mm -hmm. center in the United States, and if you're not signed in, you're going to be hitting a data center in Amsterdam. And, mm -hmm. and you're pretty confident that that's going to change uh, perceptions of performance. Like, I mean, it seems obvious, but I just want to like, Parse that out. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. In relation to latency is. Exchange. I mean, I'm I'm clearly looking at the signed exchange proposal, and I'm trying to get you to comment. On ah that. yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's it's not something that we're considering because it means that we would have to um to to expose IP addresses to a third party if we were going to use the third party CDN to host our signed exchange. So it's not. It's not something we're interested in. Um, and it doesn't really solve the problem of the locked in experience for us because um, it's even worse. Like there was, there's no way we would let any locked in user go through a third party uh, for privacy reasons. Um, but the, the problem is in the MediaWiki infrastructure. Like the, the MediaWiki is very old uh, and it was not designed uh, with a multi data center set up uh, from the beginning. And so we're slowly adding capabilities to be able to do that. It's taking literally years to essentially um, modify the way it behaves so that it can deal with having multiple data centers that have lag between them. And so ultimately we'll be able to have multiple data centers active at once for logged in users and uh, hopefully some will be closer to people than others. Um, so it's, it's like it's just a huge pile of technical debt for us is preventing us from providing the same performance to logged in users as logged out users. Also, we don't do uh, composition at the edge. Like when you look at a Wikipedia article, most of the content is the same when you're logged in and logged out. What's changing is some of the Chrome, you know, some of the icons, the capabilities you can do on the page. Um, but the bulk of the article itself is the same. So you think, okay, why don't we just catch that and inject it? But then again, the same thing. Our architecture was not designed with that in mind from the beginning, and it's very difficult for us to at that now. It's a, Wikimedia is a very slow moving ship. We we're, we're, have a lot of big problems to solve and not all of engineers. And so we know the solutions to those problems just taking a long time to implement. Um, so no sign exchanges would not solve that problem in particular. This is really an issue that has to do with our own infrastructure. And you know we've always operated with our own data centers uh, and uh, I believe this is not gonna change. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah. And, and we're putting new edge caches which ultimately might end up being data centers that also are used for a lot of users when we can do composition. And so ideally, you know, when, once we've evolved the code base enough, we'd be able to show people the article text very quickly and then the rest of the locked in experience might show up later, for example, coming from a mass data center. That's unfortunately years away <laughs> given our capacity, but um, yeah. yeah, essentially right now we know for certain that locked in users have an objectively much lower experience because of this limitation. 
Yeah, I was just I was just wondering if like this because I, I agree with you 100 percent about the micro the micro kind of metrics um, at the front part. And I, I really appreciate your emphasis on the long tail and low to that end. But I'm wondering if also like there if we have if we're also forgetting about the very, very early part of that, which is the network part and the redirects. And like, I do feel like a lot. Oh, of yeah, yeah. We, we, we measure that, too. And, it, it, you know, we have like it. Again, it might be a good problem to have is it seems that there's no effect at all from this very, very sooner part, uh, but it might be because our network is good. And so this is like the latency. I think the issue probably is that um, users are, are used to a certain amount of latency depending on where they are. I imagine that if you, if you live in Australia, you're getting used to the latency that you have when you experience most uh, American websites. Um, right. And I think that this is an area where we're doing not better, but not worse than others. And so that's really why it doesn't seem to be correlated at all to uh, the opinion that we're getting. But we looked at that too. The, okay. the latency metrics were not uh, doing well in terms of correlation to people's opinions. Yeah, that's just uh, like the other part um, of the technosphere, right? Along with the hardware increasing, I just want to be able to make sure that we, yes. can, um, we can measure the network part of that as well, as well as the hardware. That's kind of where I'm going. Yes. Uh, so I, I, I created something I need to update it, but um, we, we have, it was supposed to be monthly updated, but the last three months have not been published yet. Um, a report of raw metrics per network per autonomous, autonomous system. It's like I, I've been trying to also figure out what's the network responsibility in the mix. Um, and hopefully, uh, in our case, identify networks that are not necessarily doing well. And if we can peer to them, go to them and say, look, you know, if, you, if we compare the, 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 the run metrics, like the overall experience of users who come from your network, uh, they're having I think we might have lost his view again. Ah, uh, OK. Uh, Bummer. Sorry, I'm back. Uh, so yeah, I was saying that, uh, yeah, so I've been trying to do the same thing for network. Um, okay. Essentially okay. trying to isolate in the, uh, in like take the raw metrics and slice them by the network that people connected from. And beyond okay. that, uh, I would also like to be able to do that, not just by origin AS, but by AS path to see if some networks along the way yeah. are, are slowing down the experience. And we're lucky enough to have so much data from our visitors that, that we can do this with enough uh, data to be meaningful. Uh, I guess a small website will have trouble figuring that out, but we hope that we can also do that. And so by, by doing this, um, also I'm hoping that we can somehow extract the network responsibility in the mix. But it's looking more and more you know, throughout the whole experience that nowadays the device is a much more important factor. Yeah. Um, you know. I have a question uh, from our Slack channel. Um, what what were the five wikis that were used in your testing? Oh, uh, I think there was uh, French, um, Catalan, uh, Russian, uh, and then we had English Wiki Voyage um, and some some other. I'm forgetting the last one. Spanish was added more recently. It wasn't a part of the original study. Spanish is interesting. It came from a suggestion from um, someone on our research team because uh, the ones that we had before, French, Russian, uh, were the ones that were getting the most traffic. Uh, Catalan is too small uh, for a lot of stuff they wanted to do. Um, they're very, um, um, they're, they have a very strong center of gravity geographically. Most visitors of the French Wikipedia are in France. Most visitors of Russian Wikipedia are in Russia. And Spanish is very interesting because it's a lot more distributed. You have, of course, a lot of people from Spain, but they're almost a minority when compared to kind of people coming from Latin America. So you have a very wide range of country GDPs and uh, diverse capabilities, depending on what people are connecting from. And so and lately, Spanish has been the most interesting one for us to study because um, it's, it's bringing very different audiences, essentially. It's less uniform than looking at uh, languages that are tend to be uh, and so and the reason why we haven't done English is uh, more of a practical community one, which is that um, most studies tend to focus too much on English Wikipedia, and the community is getting tired 
of being studied. <laughs> and so I decided to just avoid that problem and focus on other languages because uh, they, they, there's a very significant survey fatigue on English Wikipedia because most researchers, either you know our own research team or external researchers, they want to study English Wikipedia first. And so there's a bit too much going on there. So I wanted to leave them alone. And I think most of the findings we're finding translate exactly between the different languages, like the ratios are a bit different, but uh, you know the findings were the same on the different languages that we looked at. So I don't think it's necessary for us to run the same survey on English Wikipedia for to, to find out that you know people uh, might have a slightly different uh, ratio of happiness, but overall that it maps the same to performance metrics, etc. It's good enough to have one uh, big wiki or a couple of big wikis if you want to verify your assumptions are correct. Um, it's not necessary to run this everywhere. And a, a follow-up question has come in as well, which is, uh, do you have any thoughts on running the same experiment on other Wikimedia properties, such as Wiki, uh, MediaWiki, um, rather than simply the different languages? Yeah, um, and WikiVoyage is one of them. The problem is okay. that the other, the other projects are too small in terms of traffic. Um, like we have put it on WikiVoyage from the very beginning, uh, but it's not, it's not gathering enough data for it to be uh, statistically significant, and if we crank it up and to get more data, it becomes annoying because the survey shows up too often. There's a limit to how often you can show it before becoming annoying. You know, people don't want to see that on every page to visit. And so since we're limited to only asking a small sample of people, unfortunately this methodology is limited to uh, our projects that get a lot of traffic. Uh, so that's the reason why we haven't pushed to move it to other projects because we think that we're going to have the same problem on other Smaller projects like, you know, I'm, I don't know the figures, but Wikipedia is by and large our by far our biggest traffic source compared to other smaller projects. But what I would be really interested in is for other web properties to do something similar. Like that's something that I would really like to have to see happen. Is I'm very curious to see if the findings we have, the correlations with our metrics and all that stuff, really applies universally to other websites. Like how different would it be to run this on something that's completely different, maybe even a commercial for-profit website? Um, you know, that, that would be quite interesting to compare the, the findings to something completely different using a similar methodology. When you gathered these, uh, or when you sent these surveys out, do you um, discern the, the browser that's in use? Um, yes. And do you see much variance? Uh, oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some browsers are doing it terribly, <laughs> but you, you can, you can, the 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 paper is is you can download it. It's public. Um, you know, I can share the link after the presentation. You can dig into the the findings, you know, the very detailed findings for all the different ways you can slice the data. But yes, the some browsers. I think it was uh, Samsung Internet was the worst by far. But I think you shouldn't read too much into that because there's fairly high correlation between people having using that browser as their default and being on a low powered, uh, cheap Samsung device. So, you know, if you look at the slices, you could say, oh, look, you know, this browser is doing so great, but it's not, you know, it's, there's never a factor that's on its own. You know, it tends to be highly correlated to other things. And so, yes, some browsers are doing better than others. Um, but um, again, the problem with the smaller browsers is that we don't, don't necessarily have enough data to do, say, just that browser in that country with that kind of network and then have a fair comparison between browsers. Maybe we do now that we're collecting more data, but not at the time we did the study. I think the study had um, you know, something like less than 200,000 responses, and now we're getting 24,000 a day. So nowadays, maybe I could do a, a fair comparison between browsers looking at a specific slice, you know, people who, um, who have a specific kind of network, so we know that it's not a network in bottleneck or device, you know, same device, and then look at different browsers. So that's something we could do. Yeah, definitely. That's great. Um, all right, we've filled the hour, uh, so we've come to the end of the time. Um, thank you very much, Jim. Uh, thank you for everybody for attending. Um, take care, and uh, look out for another event, hopefully scheduled soon. Let me know if you do have any suggestions for guests or topics that you'd like me to try to find somebody to, to cover. Uh, so thanks again, Gilles, and uh, take care. See you all next time. Thank you.